part of worship, part of the effect of worship on our lives. You know, worship is for God, but, but also there's an effect on our lives as we worship God. It plows over the ground of our heart, and then when the seed of God's Word is planted into our hearts, uh, it has a much better chance of actually coming to fruition, uh, to actually change our lives, and to bring faith, and to do all of the things that God's Word has been designed to do. Uh, this morning we are picking up where we left off last Sunday, in fact uh, two Sundays ago. Uh, we started a new series of, uh, of messages entitled, Learning to Walk in the Steps of Abraham's Faith. It's just a title, we are talking about faith in a general sense, but we are looking at the life of Abraham and working out how we can walk by faith. And of course many of you are walking by faith, these teachings are not new to you, but have you know that we always need to be reminded of the things of, of faith? Um, because uh, we live in a world that's anti-faith. We live in a world that flows the other way. And so we need to constantly hear uh, the, the, the concepts and the principles of faith. In fact, the Bible says faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come by having heard. So we need to hear it again uh, so that we can be sure that we're walking by faith. And then, of course, there's new people that get saved and they haven't heard anything about faith. So they need to learn how to walk by faith. And so in that respect, we decided to pick up this theme right now. Uh, and for the next few weeks, that's what we are focusing on. And I believe that God wants us uh, to get a greater handle on faith and how to walk by faith and what it all means. How many of you not, not already know more that, uh, how to walk by faith than what you did three weeks ago? Like you've already learned some things and, and you've implemented it already. It's not just hearing but doing. And uh, so with that, I want to pick up again in our key scripture here in Romans chapter 4 and in verse 11. And it says that Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. And right there we see that Abraham is actually our father. Whether we are Jewish or not, the Bible says he is the father of all those who believe. So we are believers. It says, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. So the Bible speak, speaks there about some steps of faith that Abraham took. Uh, and anybody that studies the Word of God on faith will always end up somewhere uh, in the life of Abraham to find out uh, how he walked by faith and how we can learn to walk by faith just the same. So a couple of points quickly that uh, we made last week. We said that we learn to walk by faith beginning with our salvation. If you're saved, you're already walking by faith as far as salvation is concerned. And the point now is that you transfer that principle of how to walk by faith into all areas of your life. Uh, and then secondly, we said that walking by faith begins with hearing the word of God. Uh, we quoted it before. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing uh, and hearing and hearing and hearing. And hearing and hearing. And uh, so we need to hear uh, the word of God all the time because faith does not come by having heard. And there is a deception sometimes that creeps into the lives of believers where they say, Oh, I know that already. Oh, I've heard that already. And, uh, and I think, what is it, last week or the week before, that uh, if you're hearing it again and you got that attitude, I'm suggesting you're not in faith. Because if you're in faith and you're hearing a message of faith, it'll excite you rather than bore you. If it bores you, uh, then there is a problem somewhere. So anyway, let's pray, because I don't believe that God is about to bore us for the next half an hour, 45 minutes. God wants to speak to us. So let's just pray that uh, our heart's attitude is right so we can receive the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we once again, uh, Lord, as we approach the, this time of reading the proclamation of the Scriptures, we declare right now that we are teachable. We declare that our hearts are open. We want to learn. We are ready to be transformed uh, by the renewing of our mind. We thank you, Father, that faith rises to new levels in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to walk by faith and not by sight. So we willingly uh, choose to do so. And, uh, Father, we declare that, uh, Lord, uh, that your word has got free course in each and every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 4. Um, uh, verse 1 and verse 2, where I'd like to pick up this morning. 
uh, just had a brief um, recap on where we've been so far. If you have missed any of those uh, messages so far, I'd encourage you to jump online on our website uh, and to catch up because uh, each message is uh, sequential uh, and builds on the previous message. And uh, as we've said last week, that if we are taking certain steps, uh, you can't get from A to C, you've got to get past B before you can get to C. Uh, and uh, whilst faith is not so much a formula, there are certain steps that we take and we need to know what those steps are. If one step's missed out, it's not going to function properly like it should. It's, as I said, you know, it's a bit like ringing a telephone number. You can get six numbers of seven right, and if the seventh number is not right, you're still not going to reach the person that you're trying to ring. Uh, and uh, sometimes people got a few things right, but there's a few things missing. Uh, and so let's make sure that there's nothing missing. Here it goes. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us, as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Um, here's the writer of the book of Hebrews. Some say it's Paul the Apostle. Some say it's not. It doesn't matter. It's the word of God. All right. Um, writer of the book of Hebrews tells us about a promise. Now, each time when there is a promise, that promise is meant to bring faith so we can receive what the promise promises. Um, and he tells us here that, uh, that uh, he says that the Israelites of Moses' day, they had the gospel preached to them. Um, not so much the gospel as we understand it today of Jesus' uh, sacrificial death and burial and resurrection, but the gospel was preached to them that they were able to come out of the house of bondage, out of Egypt, into the promised land and have a rest. In Egypt, they were slaves. Egypt is a type of the world. It's a type of a, a lost condition. Uh, and uh, the promised land is a type of the Christian life where we can rest and where we can uh, be in, the, in God's light and in God's blessing and so forth. And the writer of Hebrews here tells us that they heard the gospel. They had the word preached to them, but it did not profit them. Now, immediately, I want to know why. Um, because each time every word of God is supposed to profit, uh, every word of God is supposed to prosper in our lives. God tells us in Isaiah 55 that God's word comes down from heaven, and in the same way as rain comes down and causes the earth to bud and to bring forth, so my word goes forth, God says, and it shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing unto which I have sent it. And of course, we know that God's, God has sent His Word primarily to lodge in the hearts of men and of women and of children. God's Word is supposed to prosper in our hearts and bring forth. When we heard the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is part of the whole Word of God, it prospered, it brought forth, and now we are saved. That was the purpose of that particular aspect of the Word of God. If we hear the Word of God on healing, it's supposed to bring forth healing in our lives. If we, bring, if we hear the Word of God on, on, on the subject of prosperity, it's meant to bring forth prosperity in our lives. If we hear the Word of God of, on the subject of, of God's love in our lives, it's supposed to bring forth the love of God in our lives, and, and on goes the list. God's Word is supposed to prosper in our lives. It is supposed to profit. They heard the Word. It didn't profit them, and immediately I want to know why. Because I don't want to be like them that heard the Word but never got anything out of it, never, it never did anything. Uh, it's a real tragedy. All right? So they heard the Word preached, but it did not profit them. And, of course, if we were to go back uh, into, uh, um, I guess, specifically to Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, which spoke about the Israelites in the days of Moses, when Moses led them out of Egypt, brought them into the wilderness with view of taking them on into the promised land. It was meant to be an 11-day journey. And 40 years later, they're still walking around the same mountain. What a tragedy. And sometimes Christians walk around a similar mountain again and again and again, and for some reason the word doesn't profit them, 
for the same reason. And I want to know what that reason is. Would you like to know what that reason is? I mean, if you don't, I'll close the book and we'll all go home. But if you want to know, <laughs> we'll get into the Word and find out to make sure that we don't make the same mistake that they made. And uh, we learn that with the exception of uh, Joshua and Caleb, they didn't mix the Word of God with faith when they heard it. That scripture has puzzled me for years. Because I thought if faith comes by hearing, and now it's telling me that I need to mix the word with faith, what's the deal with that? But how do you know that there's many people that hear the word, but it doesn't bring faith into their hearts? Even though the Bible says faith comes by hearing. So evidently, it's possible to hear the word of God and faith does not come. It's Jesus uh, spending time with his disciples full time, like they were with him all the time, with the exception of sending them out a few times uh, on mission trips and on preaching trips and going get this. They were, they were with Jesus on several occasions when they were like waffling out on about one thing or other. Jesus says, where's your faith? What is it with you? <laughs> You've been with me this long and you haven't got any faith. And the particular in area of when it came to provision, to the miracles that he performed in feeding 3,000 and then 5,000 people or 5,000, 7,000, whatever it was, he says, where is your faith? And you know, once we become believers and we hear the word of faith preached, there ought to be faith in our hearts. And if there's not, we need to find out what's gone wrong. Um, so it is possible to hear the word of God uh, and faith does not come. And I want to know why faith did not come into the hearts of the Israelites because Hebrews tells us that they had the word preached to them, but they didn't mix it with faith. How do you mix the word of God with faith? How do you do that? Well, let's find out what they did not do. They heard the word preached, and it tells us there, it's in the outline at the bottom of page one, they did not believe it. Secondly, they did not receive it. Thirdly, they did not obey it. And fourthly, they did not act on it. Uh, now, some of these points are kind of uh, overlap a little bit. Uh, obeying it and acting on it is really the same thing, but I thought it's good to list them separately so that it describes what God wants us to do so that the Word will actually profit us. You see, what's the point in opening up the Bible to read it on a daily basis if it, it's actually possible that it doesn't actually profit us? Because really, uh, after it's all said and done, it does take time and effort to read the Word, and if it doesn't profit, what's the point? All right. But each time I open the book, I want that word to profit me. I want that word to bring forth transformation. I want that word to deliver faith into my heart so that I can actually move forward in the purposes of God and walk by faith. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We're, not, we're now looking at what's supposed to happen. Um, the Israelites have failed. Um, and uh, when Moses preached the word to them, he says, there is a promised land waiting for you, a land that flows with milk and honey. God says, I'm going to lead you out. Uh, follow the leader. Moses is his name. He will lead you out. You will come to Mount Horeb. I'll give you the Ten Commandments. You worship me there. And then you're on in uh, into the promised land. Eleven days. And you're out of slavery, out of bondage in the promised land. The promised land is a, is a type of the Christian life. Uh, a land that flows with milk and honey, uh, where there is blessing instead of cursing, where there is abundance instead of scarcity, where there is health instead of sickness, where there is freedom insta instead of bondage. All right? First Thessalonians 2.13, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of man, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Circle the word there, it performs its work in you who believe. God's word performs its work. God ha has sent his word to perform a work in our lives. 
to prefer, perform its work in us who believe. And in order for that to happen, there's four points that we can pick up on, on what the Thessalonians did to what the others did not do. First of all, they believed it. That somewhere along the way, when we hear the word of God preached, we've just got to decide that we will, we will either believe this or not. There's got to be a, de a decision made on our part to say, yes, I recognize that as the word of God. I choose to believe it, and immediately it puts me into position for the word to do a work in my life. Uh, secondly, they received it. Um, <laughs> how many you know it's possible when we hear the word of God that there is actually a, a, a place of receiving the word rather than letting it pass us by? Sometimes people sit there and say, oh, I'm glad he said that because that's for brother so-and-so that sits three row behind me. Oh, I'm glad he said that because that's for sister so-and-so that sits uh, uh, three places down the row from where I'm sitting. Like they, the People let the word of God bypass them and say, that's for other people. <laughs> but actually, it's for all of us. So we receive the word of God. All right. And then thirdly, that they accepted it as the word of God. They accepted it as the word of God. Um, in the early days of people's journey in getting saved and so forth, people are, are, are not always convinced that the Bible is actually the written word of God. We've got to do some study. We've got to do some, some work in order to check it out, to kind of delve into it and to, as it were, scrutinize it. And, and determine, is this really the Word of God, or is this just a collection of fables and stories? Is this just a history book, or is this actually literally the Word of God? I remember many, many years ago, just after I got saved, I came across a book called The Seal of God. Some of you may know it. I sometimes refer to it. It made such an impact on my life. And because there's other books that have been written that are equally good um, in, in, in order to kind of verify that the Word of God is, in fact, the written Word of God. Um, and uh, Vanessa and I lived in the city in Wellington um, at that time, and that was the days when we still had milkmen. Have you, have you remember the milkman? <laughs> I mean, now there's milkman. Who is that? Um, people go to the supermarket and buy their milk there, but there's uh, back then they had milkman. He would come to your house. He would just come into the street with his truck, and he would stop, and he'd have a few boys running around, the uh, litter boxes, and there would be a, a little crate with uh, some milk bottles inside. He would tip out the little, uh, what do you call it, those little coin thingies, and uh, you know, take the empty bottles away and give you some milk and here's the milkman and uh, and I was praying for the milkman and uh, he clearly wasn't saved and uh, but he was a really good guy and uh, so I one day I went down to pick up the milk that he had just brought he said look at this I've got a book that I would like for you to read and I gave him the book called the seal of God it's only a small book, book like this it's not like huge or anything but I don't know however many pages and uh, and so forth and I gave it to him and I really prayed that somehow uh, you know that book would make an impact on his life and uh, some weeks later I ran into him again and I says how'd you get on with the book he says oh yeah 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 I says D -d -d did you read it he says yes I did I says did it speak to you he says I won't let it I won't let it he says what do you mean I won't let the book speak to me and uh, so, so in other words <laughs> he kind of didn't receive it but you know once the word goes in if somebody doesn't get saved just immediately the words working away way on the inside and I, I lost touch with him for all I know he might be saved today and for all I know that could have become the catalyst for this man to get saved people are on a journey and we must not get discouraged when they immediately turn down the message that we give to them so he decided that he wasn't going to let the book speak to him so in other words like oh no 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 my my heart's closed I'm not letting this speak to me because if I let it speak to me it'll place a responsibility on my life to change my life I'll become responsible for my actions I'll become responsible to God whom I'm trying not to believe in and I'm responsible and so this is what happens you see that's why when we you know we give something to somebody or we invite somebody we need to pray for these people that there is an openness for the word to go in and to lodge in their hearts. The Bible says that the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ shines into the hearts of people to bring light into darkness. Not everybody gets saved immediately. 
Uh, in fact, many times people have to hear the gospel two, three times before they will actually get saved. But once it goes in, it pries open, it cracks open uh, a kind of a, a place for, for the word to, to go in again and, and so forth. And with prayer, people eventually come through. So the Thessalonians believed the word. They received it. They accepted it. They acted on it. And the question is, what do you do with the word when you hear it? What do you do with the word when you hear it? Because each time we hear the word, it places a responsibility on us for some kind of a response, some kind of a deal uh, that the word requires from us. We cannot, everybody say cannot. <laughs> we cannot hear the word of God week after week after week or day after day as we read the word or we listen to a CD or we put on a DVD of some preaching. We cannot just hear it and do nothing about it. Otherwise, we are just like the Israelites in the days of Moses who heard the word, but it did not profit them. I tell you, over the years, in the existence in the life of our church, we have seen radical transformation in the lives of people. I mean radical transformation. People have come out of a place of almost insanity into a, into a state of just normality. People have come out of brokenness into a, into a place of peace and of blessing and of prosperity. People have come from demonic bondages into glorious liberty. There is an anointing on this church, on this house, to bring people from bondage into liberty. But it can only happen if people respond to the preaching of the word. That's the strength in this house. That is, the word is being proclaimed. The word travels. It goes forth. The Bible says, but then it becomes the responsibility of the recipient to see what we're going to do about this. The word only performs its work in us if and when we believe it. God is looking for faith in our hearts primarily. Even to believe places a responsibility on me, will I or will I not? God wants to see faith. And if the word is proclaimed and it's properly received, faith will be there. Paul the Apostle said in Romans, the word of faith which we preach. That's why we don't bother much with... Um, you know, stuff, people, sometimes people say, oh, you know, tell us stories or tell us this, tell us that. Only the word brings faith. Only the word brings faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is, what is? The gospel, the word of God. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Please note, the Bible tells us that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But then he puts a disclaimer in there and it says, to those who believe. So what's that telling us? It's, it's, the power, it's not the power of God to other people? No, potentially it is. Potentially it is. Potentially, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everybody. But the potential will only be realized if we believe. The gospel is the power of God only to those who believe. Only. Everybody say only. In 1 Corinthians 1.18... It says, for the message of the cross. What's that? That's the gospel. Just another way of putting the same thing. Gospel, message of the cross, same thing. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the Bible here speaks about us and them. Us and them. Us who are saved and those who are perishing. 
Now, God's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. He tells us that. But the only way that they can get saved is they hear the gospel and somewhere along the way decide to receive it as the word of God rather than, oh, what are you trying to tell me? You're trying to tell me that you know, I live a good life. You're trying to tell me that I can't get, get to heaven. I don't murder nobody. I ro don't rob banks. I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong. And, and, and so somewhere along the line, people have to receive the word of God and believe it. Otherwise, they will not be able to uh, realize that potential that's in the word of God to bring forth salvation in their lives. Here's another sentence there, and it's in your outline. Our attitude towards the Word of God determines whether or not faith comes when we hear it preached. Yet, yet Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing. The potential is there, but whether it will really do that determines on your attitude and my attitude towards it. Jesus says, be careful how you hear. Be careful how you hear. And another time he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, everybody's got ears. Oh, yeah, everybody's got physical ears, but not everybody decides to have spiritual ears. He wasn't talking about physical ears. He's talking about the, 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 the inner man on the inside of us having ears to receive and to hear the word of God. So be careful how you hear. It is not uncommon just as an example, it is not uncommon for people during the preaching of the word to start flipping around and walking in and walking out. And uh, it has not even been uncommon that while the preaching of the word goes on here for people to sit out in the cafe having a cup of coffee and having a little chat with somebody. Be careful how you hear. Don't think you're smarter than God. Don't think that you don't need that because the very people who think who don't need it have the, the greatest need. Be careful how you hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. There was a day, and I've said this before, there was a day 30, 40, 50 years ago when the preacher would get up and get ready for starting preaching, and he had opened the book. And as soon as he get ready to read what they would call the text, they said, let's all stand. And people would stand up. And this is not about tradition as much as it is in honor of the word of God and in honor of the one who has spoken to us to bring a word into our lives that's meant to prosper and profit us if our attitude is right. I remember seeing a, uh, a video of Oral Roberts, one of the greatest evangelists of modern times because he's since gone to heaven. And he'd literally, like, he'd pack out, he'd pack out uh, auditoriums right across America. And in the end, he was on television. He was the first one to get on television and everything and, uh, and, and you know, preach the gospel. And he's an evangelist, uh, uh, preaching the gospel, getting people saved and getting people healed. And he'd open the book and he'd stand there and then everybody would stand up. And, and you know, sometimes we can get a bit flippant with the things of God. And it's to our detriment. Be careful how you hear. Watch your attitude when you hear the word of God. And don't say, oh, I'm glad that sister so-and-so is here. She needed to hear that. No, every one of us need to hear the word of God. Is everybody all right this morning? <laughs> Let's watch our attitude because it will determine whether the word will bring faith or not. So how do we mix faith with the word? when we hear it preached. This is really where I was trying to get to. I said all of that to say this. <laughs> that was my introduction. <laughs> James chapter 1, verse 21. And 22 says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. See, it tells us here that the word is able to save our soul. God's word has ability. People say God has ability, and that's right. But God's put ability within his word to accomplish things. And if we fail to understand that and take a flippant approach to the word, 
God will not do very much in our lives because he's limited by our attitude. Book of Psalms tells us that again of the Israelites in the days of Moses, again and again, they limited the Holy One of Israel. God, who is almighty, was limited by the people. Fancy that. Receive the word implanted. The word needs to be engrafted or implanted into our hearts. It needs to find a resting place. Not be pushed to the side somewhere and be made a side issue, but the word needs to become a main issue in each and every one of our lives. People say, I love God. Then let me ask you the question, do you love his word? Because if you don't love his word, you don't love God either. Prove yourselves, verse 22, to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And James tells us here that it is possible to be self-deluded or self-deceived. I've said this before, it's bad enough when the devil deceives people, but I reckon it's worse when people deceive themselves. How do you become self-deceived? By hearing the word and not doing anything about it. Our willingness to do what the word says demonstrates that we have received the word and that we believe it. Story goes that uh, a man by the name of uh, Blondie, Blondine, uh, a tightrope walker, stretched the rope across the uh, Niagara Falls, waterfall up in northern part of the U.S., southern part of Canada, and he walked back and forth with a stick in his hand and so forth, and uh, then he got to the other side and said, how many of you believe I can do this again? They said, yeah, 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 we believe. <laughs> we believe. So he stepped down and says, why don't you hop on my shoulders to one of the guys and says, no. <laughs> I'll knock it on your shoulders. And so sometimes we use the word believe a bit flippantly. If it does not bring forth action in our lives, we're not really believing it to the degree that God wants us to believe the word. James chapter 2, verse 14. My brothers and sisters, what good is, for, is it for people to say that they have faith if their actions do not prove it? We're talking about faith. We're talking about Bible faith, all right? It says, what good is it? If people say they have faith, if their actions do not prove it, can that faith save them? And verse 26 then says, uh, as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without actions is dead. I don't know about you. I want no dead faith. I want a faith that's alive. I want a faith that's working. I want a faith that's functioning. And this is the deal. If we were to have, and I don't mean to be gross or anything, but if, there were, if we were to have a body here, say somebody that, uh, whose spirit has already moved on to heaven, we had the body right there. That body's got all the muscles, all the sinews, all the things that is needed except life. And sometimes, you know, people have dead faith. It's, dead, it's faith, but it's, it's dead. It's not, it's not been made complete. It is kind of a, it, it's kind of a, 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 a non-working sort of a deal. And I hate it when things don't work. I just don't like it. If I have a gadget and it doesn't work, it annoys me. And I I'll open the thing up, I'll do what I can to get it working. As I say, but if there's, uh, I was just fiddling around with some light switches in my house and changing a few things around, and there was one thing there that wasn't working, it just annoys me. What's the point in having that thing on the wall if I switch it and it doesn't do anything? What is the point? Now, that's only a little thing, and some of us are annoyed at little things, uh, and, and some of us are not, but uh, <laughs> I want my faith to be working. I don't want to be self-deluded. I don't want to think I'm in faith, and then actually the reality is I'm not in faith. I want that deal to be working. This thing is too important to get to the end of our lives and say, oh, sorry, dead faith. Can that faith save him? And tragically, there are people in churches, I'm talking across the board, who all they have is dead faith and it's not working. They're running along, as it were. They're going through some of the motions. 
but it's never brought forth a heartfelt change in their lives. That faith is inactive faith, and because of its inactivity, it is incomplete. It's like I said before, you ring somebody locally, uh, seven numbers, push button, do, 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 do. If you ring somebody nationally, it's nine numbers. Whatever it is, you leave one number out, you're not going to get to them. <laughs> and so it is with faith. We leave on uh, one major step or leave out three, four steps. You say, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. No, we need to do the whole deal. It says the Bible faith or real Bible faith is always demonstrated by corresponding action, always. There's a great theologian by the name of John Wesley. John Wesley became the founder of the Methodist church movement. The Wesley brothers, there's John Wesley and uh, Charles, if I remember correctly. Contemporaries like uh, John Whitfield, just great preachers whom God used in the Great Awakening in America and in organizing uh, kind of mission societies up and down England and Ireland and Wales, just the whole United Kingdom there. When we talk about itinerant preachers, that's what they started over there. They had circuit riders that would travel around and uh, they had these societies, what they called societies, groupings organized in different localities. And most of the people there were Anglican, but the Anglican church had seemingly lost its way a little bit. And John Wesley began to preach personal salvation and personal responsibility in order to respond to the Word of God. And uh, because back then there's all sorts of uh, stuff that wasn't functioning. And so so John Wesley, in fact, um, um, him and his brother, and his brother in particular, they wrote over a thousand songs, uh, preached 40,000 sermons. Much of our theology today, as we understand it, has come from John Wesley because he began to organize what they call organized or systematic theology, preaching on this and on that and organizing the whole issue of doctrine and so forth. Um, John Wesley spoke of a counterfeit faith. He saw it back then, and I'm telling you, it's around today. He spoke of a counterfeit faith, and he called it mental ascent, where people mentally agree to the truths of the Bible, but they lack real hard faith, which moves them to action. Mental ascent. In fact, Brother Hagen in his teaching on faith talked about that a fair, a fair bit. Uh, sometimes people mentally ascend. As this guy, um, when he was asked, do you believe that I can walk across the tightrope again, across the Niagara Falls? Absolutely we believe it, but when the chips were down, he was not prepared to jump on the shoulder of the man that was able to carry him across. Um, so kind of a mentally assenting uh, to a truth, but not allowing it to touch our heart to bring forth a heartfelt change. There's a quote here by John Wesley. It says, My ground is the Bible. Yea, I am a Bible bigot. I follow it in all things, both great and small. I tell you, uh, be good to read after some of these guys. Um, John Wesley and his brother and George Whitfield, they were at uh, Oxford University, uh, and they started what they called a holy club started to have small group meetings, uh, and they would do Bible study. And because they were so methodical in their study, they're just not flippant, they were just quite methodical. This is what we're going to do. They fasted every Wednesday and every Friday. They studied the Word of God every day. Uh, and because they were so methodical, they were called the Methodists. That's where that term comes from, being methodical. Um, and uh, and he, he spoke of that counterfeit faith, that was around back then, and it is no doubt around today, where people mentally assent to a truth, uh, but the Word of God has never reached a place in their heart where it brings forth a change or a corresponding action in their lives. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, 
I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. So here's Jesus speaking about the very self-same thing that we are discussing here this morning about faith, uh, that the word needs to move us to action for faith to really be there in our hearts. If we only hear the word and do nothing about it, it's dead faith that does not do a thing. Only, let me start again, we can only claim to have real Bible faith if we move beyond hearing God's word to doing God's word. The whole aspect of applying the truths of God's word in our lives. Many people have what's called a dualism going on in their lives. They call it dualism because they got a foot in, in, in the church, so to speak, and they hear that, and then they got a foot in the world, and then they do that. And then they come back over here. It's called dualism. But how do you know that church is not only good for Sunday, but it's also good for Monday? It's good for Tuesday, it's good for Wednesday, it's good for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then it's good again for Sunday. The Word of God becomes the constitution of our lives. You know, they talk about government constitution with all the laws and regulations. The Word of God is that. And if there is a clash between the constitution of the land and the constitution of the kingdom of God, guess which one has to give way? We'll run with the Word of God rather than with what uh, politicians try to force on us. The Word becomes all of that. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. God's word is supposed to bring prosperity, and it's supposed to bring success to our lives. Now, of course, different people's concept of success and prosperity is different to what you know the bible concept is but god's word is supposed to work in our lives god has sent it to do a job in each and every one of our lives god's word is meant to bring uh, liberty where there was bondage it's meant to bring peace where there was fear or confusion it's meant to bring health where there was sickness it's meant to bring prosperity where there was poverty. It's meant to bring restoration, where there was uh, turmoil and strife. And sometimes, uh, some people are in strife permanently, just permanent strife in their lives. They're always scrapping with somebody. The Bible says the servant of the Lord must not strive. Get out of strife. You're in strife, you're not walking by faith. Some people permanently are offended at somebody. If you're offended... You're not in faith. I can tell you that much. Why? Because the Bible says we need to be doers of the word. The Bible says forgive. If I don't forgive, I'm not a doer. The Bible says love all people. If I don't love all people, I'm not a doer. The Bible says give and be generous in giving. If I don't give, I'm not a doer. How many of you are excited this morning? <laughs> that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. When there is a constant uh, struggle, a constant, a constant disaster, constant calamity, constant something is going on, something is wrong with the picture. If we're not shifting from Egypt towards the promised land. If we're not moving from slavery into the glorious liberty, that he whom the Son sets free, he shall be free indeed. If we're not shifting from one to the other, maybe there's dead faith. And James tells us how to cause dead faith to come alive so that we can have good success. James chapter 2, verse 18 through to verse 24. But someone will say, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions, and I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a strong word. 
Pastor James, preaching to the congregation, says, you say you believe? Well, the devils believe too. But they don't repent. They can't repent. They, they, they tremble. The demons sometimes do more than what some Christians do. That there is meant to be a kind of a sense of trembling when we hear the word of God and an eagerness to do what it says. It's going away. And sometimes, you know, husband and wife or brothers and sisters or mums and kids or who, who knows what, going away. And rather than determining we're not going to do that, and say, how can we apply that word in our lives so we can have better success and better prosperity and ultimately be more pleasing to God? The demons also believe and tremble with fear. Verse 20, you fool, do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see? His faith and his actions working together. His faith was made perfect through his actions. And the scriptures came true and said Abraham believed. And because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham was called God's friend. You see then that it is by people's actions that they're put right with God and not by faith alone. Martin Luther, I'll close with this uh, story shortly. <clears throat> um, Martin Luther had the revelation, we talked about it in our first session, the great theologian, the great reformer, German monk, by the name of Martin Luther, had the revelation that the just shall live by faith. Martin Luther was kind of born into a setting where it's all by works. Works, 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 works. The more you do, the more chances you have of getting saved. And suddenly here's the revelation that the just shall live by faith. There was a time in Martin Luther's life when he, he thought the book of James should not be in the Bible because it speaks of works. And he's just been saved from that. <laughs> so he, he, was, he was just anti-works. It's faith and by faith alone. But as we said last week, our faith needs to produce some works because if it doesn't produce works, it's dead faith and it doesn't do anything. And so, yes, somebody might try to work their way into salvation and it can't be done. But once we are saved and once we hear the word of God and once faith has come, we need to swing into action and bring forth what we might call a corresponding action. If I hear the word of God, I bring forth a corresponding action. What does God require from me from this word? So he goes on to say, you see then, um, verse 24, then that it is by people's actions that they're put right with God and not by faith alone. Faith, real Bible faith, is only real Bible faith if it has a corresponding action to go with it. If I'm praying and I'm receiving something in prayer and, and, and I stand on the word of God, but if that word does not bring forth a faith action, I'm liable to have dead faith and it won't do anything. And tragically, there are loads of people who think they're in faith, but because there is no action in their lives, it is actually only dead faith. So Abraham's faith was made complete by his corresponding actions, which he brought forth. Quick summary of Abraham's actions. Abraham was a worshiper. One of the best faith actions is to worship God. Every believer, a worshiper. That's God's intention. I was at a men's meeting in Australia a few months ago. And uh, I kind of shared my frustration that average church service, you look around, there could be 15 to 20% of people worshipping, the rest are just standing there. People say, well, can't I worship God in my own way? No. No. It's to be the Bible way. <laughs> so Abraham was a worshipper. 
That was my, it's one of the biggest faith actions. When we pray and we receive something, we worship God. Thank you, Jesus, that you supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that you've healed me by the stripes of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that you've blessed my life. We worship God. When God put his finger on Isaac's life, so to speak, and said to Abraham, I want you to bring the boy up to the mountain. I want you to sacrifice him to me. Abraham grabbed the boy and up the mountain he went. <laughs> and of course we know that that was a kind of a, a kind of test the situation to see how committed Abraham really was. And there's a bit more to it than what we can cover in the next couple of minutes. But Abraham went up the mountain and uh, he, was gonna, he was getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. And God says, no, don't kill the boy. I just, uh, I just, because you have not held back your son, I'm now able to give you my son. And, and so in other words, Abraham acted on his faith. Uh, Abraham brought forth a corresponding action. And there ought to be a quest in each and every one of our lives to say, is there anything else that I can do as far as the Word of God is concerned? Well, what else? Is there anything that's not functioning in my life because I want to have life, faith, rather than dead faith? Let's just close our eyes and as we prepare to close with a word of prayer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you. We thank you once again for your word. That, Lord, it is always alive. It blesses us. It brings faith. We choose to respond to it right now. We choose, Lord, to receive it. We choose to believe it. We lay a hold of it. We, we choose to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And I thank you, Lord God, that our faith is rising to new levels. I thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, we are moving into great faith. We are moving to great faith. And it's not like when Jesus comes uh, he will not say, how is it that you have no faith? He will find faith in each and every one of, one of our lives. He'll find faith in this church. Lord, we cannot speak for other churches, but there will be faith in this church. And we thank you, Lord God, that we are able to reach out and bring other people into saving faith of Jesus Christ. That, Lord, you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And I thank you, Father, that even this week, you're helping us, Lord, to reach out to lost people, to help to bring them into saving faith, to invite them into the right setting, to invite them into that Alpha course, to invite them along to whatever setting and area where they can hear the Word of God. I thank you, Father, that each and every one of us are freshly empowered to do the Word uh, instead of just being hearers only. And Lord, at this time, I declare and I pronounce a blessing of every family. We declare we are blessed. A blessing over every marriage a blessing over every uh, career that's undertaken, that people can prosper and, and, and advance and, and go up in this world. A blessing, my God, over every business that is represented here. Blessed in Jesus' name. That's our confession. And I thank you, Father, that as we honor you with the tithe and with the offering, that the windows of heaven are indeed open and blessings are being poured out in abundance. Lord, we don't care what the economy does. We are hooked into God's economy. I thank you, Lord God, that we're going from strength and from glory to glory, that we're going up in the world. There's more prosperity for every one of us. There's more liberty for every one of us. There's more peace in our homes for every one of us. We declare it. We lay a hold of it in Jesus' name. And, Father, we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. Amen. Praise God.